MSU community. In our search through multiple mediums, we decided to bring to a program that has had a deep meaning and impact on all those whom it has touched. We also wanted to find a member of the MSU faculty who has awed every student that has had the honor to work with him in some capacity. Tonight, it is through the inspiration of the original last lecture series by Randy Pausch that we present to Dr. James Pochin, Chair of the MSU Radiology Department. Through his years of service and dedication to this university, he is a legend in his own right, <laughs> holding high honors in, 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 in serving as President of the Society of Nuclear Medicine, President of the Fleischer Society, and Chairman of the Liaison Committee for Medical Education. Dr. Polchin has had a wide impact on the field of medicine. He has served on seven scientific journal editorial boards. He has authored or edited 31 books and has authored and co-authored 42 chapters of medical text. In addition to 167 publications and the referred press in the fields of chest radiology, neuroradiology, neuroscience, magnetic resonance, social economic implications of medical care, and the role of the university in technology transfer. The list goes on and on, and we could be standing here all day and not even get to half of his accomplishments. So without further wait, I present to you our first installment of the Lax Lesher series, A Journey with a Purpose, My First 50 Years in Academia, Dr. James Polchett. for me to be here tonight, and I decided I would have my students for my freshman and sophomore seminars sit here with me so you can see exactly what we do in class. I thought this would be a nice touch if we're going to do what we really do in academia, and this is what I've been doing for a number of years. These students are with me this year, and uh, they seem to be very much thrilled at the opportunity to come and share this with us tonight. I'll introduce them to you. Uh, Liz. Oh, there's Liz. <laughs> Angie, uh, let's get the name straight. Liz Lejewski, Angie uh, Lafano, Iafano. You better introduce yourself. That, the next is Chris. Um, I'm Chelsea Reynolds. Andrew Doyle. Jay Thacker. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Lauren Fossman. Dylan Dennison. Now, this, this is the class that I teach a freshman seminar and sophomore seminar. The issue is last year we had, I'm going to sit down myself. By the way, this is not my last lecture. <laughs> <laughs> when they asked me to do this, I said, you know, the last guy to do this, that Randy Pausch, who did a great lecture, uh, he died. <laughs> and I, have, I really like the students, but I wasn't about to do that for them. Ooh, this is a nice low chair. <laughs> anyway. It's really a pleasure to be here tonight, and I, am, uh, I have a lot of stuff I'd like to talk about. Actually, I did prepare something. I spent the weekend writing, and I've never written a speech in a long time. Dave Giff said, that's just most unusual. And I did write it, and then I lost it in the computer. That's my level of technology. Uh, so I couldn't find it, neither could our computer people. So tonight, what I'm going to do is do what I quickly got done because I'm so used to teaching extemporaneous with the students, and they're very used to dealing with us on all sorts of terms. The freshman seminar group is a group that I have a course in decision making in medicine, law, and business. And last year and the year before a freshman seminar group, they said, we're not done with the course. We'd like to continue to go. So we have a sophomore seminar and the same subject using the same textbook, which is the daily newspaper. Every newspaper article is an article where you can look at decisions and you can begin to understand decision analysis and decision making and actually get down to getting a finer tu tune into information and what it all means and how can they make better decisions. So we're going to talk briefly about that tonight. The, so the sophomore students, when we finished last year's class, they said we want to have this class next year. So now we have the sophomore class in the same subject, same textbook, the newspaper. Uh, it's really a relatively simple way to teach because we sit back and we try to teach Socratically. I'm not very good at that. Uh, I, I can't keep, Don Weston knows, I don't keep quiet that long. <laughs> Socrates would ask a question and, and they would, he would wait for an answer. I'm not that patient. Uh, what I would ask a question and what the major question I ask is definitions because we're all trying to communicate and the biggest barrier to communicating is thinking you've been understood. 
And the major reason for that, I think, is that different people mean different things when they use the same words. So we spend a lot of time in definitions. And of course, that's where philosophy is turned as a very important thing. Now, I'm supposed to start this off by giving you the a couple of major messages I want to deal with. One of them is, I tell the students and tell everybody, control your own destiny or someone else will. That's Noel Tishy's catchy phrase, and it's so relevant to today's society for everybody to be aware that they're on their own responsibility for what they can accomplish. Most people have, in my opinion, inappropriately low self-esteem. That's not something I suffer from. <laughs> <laughs> And I have HDS, it's called Humility Deficiency Syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> and you're going you're gonna to see some of that exemplified tonight. Now, what am I teaching? I'm teaching the courses in Lyman Briggs called, of course, Leadership, Power, and Responsibility. It's, I started that off as reflection and worldview as a scene in classical literature when I was at Johns Hopkins. I wanted to be erudite like the scholars at Hopkins were, so I really read some literature, and I got, and the students were wonderful. They taught me a tremendous amount about it. I know when we started freshman seminars, and Peter McPherson had not taught much, and I gave him a discussion on how you can teach freshman seminars, you must be reading, anybody, I think, is reading things they don't understand. And I told Peter, you're reading things you don't understand. Get 20 bright students in the room and ask them what they think. And after the second year that you'll do that, you'll begin to understand it. Uh, and it's, it's a way to learn a great deal for both the students and the professors. So I've been getting away with that for some time. Now, the leadership, power, and responsibility. We start off with Plato's Republic. We go to Aristotle's and Nicomachean and Ethics that I've taught a great deal at many different places. I really happen to like Aristotle's Ethics. Uh, Antigone is taught, uh, Marcus Aurelius, uh, Montaigne, Machiavelli, Castiglione, the art of the courtesier, and that's something the students really like, I think. Muhammad, we go to Lincoln Church and we finish up with Gandhi. When we have that series of discussions about those people who have led and why they've been successful leaders, the students seem to like that quite a bit. They sign up early for it, and we don't have that class here today, but I've done that class here for over 30 years. Now, uh, the freshman seminar I've told you about, and the sophomore seminar, I teach a course called Research in Human Communications. You know, I got that pretty strangely. I uh, was sitting in my office one day, and Chuck Salmon comes in and said, we're thinking of having you be chairman of the Department of Communicative Sciences and Disorders. And I said, I've never taken a course in the subject. And then they came back and said, the faculty wants you to be the chairman. So I said, what is this all about? So I did read some books. It's a great subject. I urge you all to study it. The whole business of human communication, how I can say a word, and some of you are going to register it in your heads. In fact, it's amazing to me that we can get a thought from my head into your head with the mere use of sound. And I don't quite understand that, so we're prepared to study it. And we are doing a great deal of work now in brain function and human communication and a variety of related things. But the neural function of words. You know, thought is, is uh, Stephen Pinker's recent book, the Na What is Thought? Thought is related to the use of words, and verbal fluency is a very important cornerstone of being able to think more effectively and efficiently. And we do discuss this in class quite a bit. Now, I'm going to go back. Tonight, I plan to go through a brief bio. Why? Because you ought to have an, a feel how I, such a strange person did what I've done in life, and and it, uh, it's still a lot of fun. I intend to continue to have a lot more fun. Then I'm going to be doing a little reflecting on things that I've learned. Uh, and actually, I try to learn a great deal. I'm very, very interested in studying. And everybody teaches me something. There's no human being that can't teach me something. And it's amazing how we can learn from each other at any phase of life. I was raised in Grand Rapids shortly after the Depression. The Depression really hit us. In the last few weeks, I've noticed how the tension around it feels similar to what it did in the late 30s, which many of you may not remember. But uh, things were, were not too good as we were coming out of the Depression. The Second World War got us out of that. And my father was a, uh, born in Vienna, Austria. He left Vienna at the end of the First World War, and he came over here and went to Northwestern University where he studied physics and uh, engineering. And then he began to work in Grand Rapids, but he was a physics professor at Aquinas College for part of my uh, career. 
And my mother was a fourth grade teacher for some 50 years. So I came from a couple of parents who really valued education almost as much as I do today. But it was a tremendous heritage. In high school, shortly after the war, when people were worried about long-term security, I really got interested in sustainable agriculture, which may be bizarre to you, but I can get interested in anything I want to. Uh, and I have been interested in a lot of things. And I did have a book, and actually I found it again, just in preparation for this speech, called Five Acres in Independence. When I was in high school, this was my dominant reading. I really did enjoy that, the idea that I could live on five acres no matter what was happening around the world with all the wars and turmoil and depression and everything else. What is it going to take to be able to take care of yourself? That's like control your own destiny. And uh, I got into that and then I said, gee, I'd like to learn more about that. So I came here and studied agriculture at Michigan State when I finished high school. And I started, I started off in agriculture and many people today can't see why I did it. We had a small greenhouse when I was in Grand Rapids and we had, I set up a business. In those days, I used to be entrepreneurial. And I learned how to uh, make a little money and learn how to have a little job. And that put me through college. I came here, I moved into Shaw Hall, West East Shaw Hall, the day it opened, in 1950. Uh, it hasn't changed a bit. <laughs> and uh, it, uh, uh, but we had this greenhouse and I, I got very much involved with agriculture and, and I the first course I took was from Dean Anthony in the School of Agriculture, Ag 101, if you can picture that. And I took soil science and ornamental plant management and I got pretty active in horticulture and then I figured, you know, there's something a little more academically intense and I tried medicine. It was a little more academically intense but not much more because you can devote academic intensity to any subject just as much as there's no different distinction that I can find a hierarchy of academic intensity or difficulty or the potentials. Uh, I, when I changed, I changed to zoology, as kind of pre-med, and I was working with Carl Stiles, who at that time was chairman of the zoology department, and he was a human geneticist. And my college roommate, family had polydactylism, six fingers, and a family history. So I began to do the lineage of polydactylism, and I got very interested in human genetics. In 1952, I joined the Society of Human Genetics. Can you picture that? That's long before we knew anything about what DNA was. In fact, DNA at that time was used to stain the nucleus. It may be important some other way, but it was so you could see the nucleus of cells. It's changed since then. When I went to Wayne Medical School, which is a whole story in itself, I interned at Butterworth Hospital in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I couldn't decide what to do then, nor can I now, and I still don't know what I'm going to be when I grow up. <laughs> but I, when I finished, I went out then into general practice, and I delivered up to 30 babies a month for $125 a delivery, if you can believe that. And I saw up to 50 patients a day in the office, and we charged $3 for a patient visit. And then we made five house calls every day, and we charged $6 for a house call. But I got to know the patients and their families where they really lived and saw how they were living and it was a tremendously rich opportunity for me to learn what was happening to people in my hometown, people who I went to high school with, how they really lived. People live differently when you get in their homes. And it is, I was really enriched opportunity and I loved it. I, 10 years anniversary of high school graduation, I went to the high school graduation 10 year anniversary party and I saw that I was doing okay. I had joined the country club, I had a new car, three kids and a new home, and I was quite pleased with myself, but I said there may be more to life. And so I went off, I got to Harvard, and I started off in radiology, and then I got, I won an award in research uh, in selenomethionine, strange amino acids and proteins, and then I went and wrote some stuff on tracer method and mathematics and tracers, and they gave me the pleasure of being the first chief of the nuclear medicine group uh, at the Peter Van Brigham Hospital, which was a pretty well-established hospital. A lot of interesting things went on at that time. After a couple of years of that, I moved on to Washington University where I became chief of nuclear medicine, then chief of diagnostic radiology. When I was at Washington University, I was elected to the United States Pharmacopeia, which is the thing that tells the safety of drugs. And uh, they had a new law just been passed, the harris kefauver law. Kefauver ran for vice president way back when with Stevenson, if you may remember. And that law said that drugs not only had to be safe, they had to be effective. And I was in charge, put in charge of diagnostic drugs. Now for a therapeutic drug to have an effect, you give it to somebody and you see an effect. 
for a diagnostic drug to have an effect, you give it to somebody, ah, but something comes out of that some person. It's called now information, because that would be the diagnostic test. And we began to, well, it was not the same as seeing the effect of a drug when you just give it to the patient. In order for a drug to have an effect, a diagnostic drug to have an effect, something has to happen like going through the brain of a physician who's going to use that information. It'll have no effect on the patient if the information's not used. And that was a completely different order of understanding. I, uh, they asked me to, I said, we wouldn't be doing it if it wasn't effective, and they said, prove it. And boy, that was hard to do. The difference there was that in, di in diagnostic tests, you had to understand how people make decisions. And ever since then, and that depends on information, and I, d I got into at that time information theory and decision making, and I've been in it ever since. I've looked at it from all kinds of ways, and I've been doing it for almost 40 years, and it is a fantastic field yet. We started the Society Medical Decision Analysis, which has gone well. Uh, the, uh, I was doing that, and then I found out that I didn't know much about it, and I'd moved out to Wash University as the chief of, uh, at that time, chief of radiology, or diagnostic radiology, and I, I did, uh, from Wash University, I went, uh, uh, I went to uh, Sloan Fellowship at MIT, and that was so I could study decision analysis initially. In fact, Jerry Ford, who'd been a Boy Scout leader when I was in Grand Rapids, wrote me a letter to get to MIT as the first physician Sloan Fellow. And there I studied economics and decision analysis and information theory. They're really pretty good there. I found an awful lot of faculty at MIT were smart enough to have gone to medical school. And when I told them that, they didn't really appreciate that because that's the classical arrogance of physicians. <laughs> <laughs> but they were very smart. And in fact, I wrote three theses. I wrote one thesis on uh, the uh, uh, use of information in medicine, in radiology, information theory group I wrote. I wrote another one on strategic planning and academic health centers. And for that one, I went down and studied Johns Hopkins University. And the third one I wrote was dynamic systems analysis of defensive medicine. Jay Forrester, the guy that invented the magnetic core memory, uh, was one of the first guys to ever go into systems analysis and dynamic systems analysis. And they were wonderful people to work with and they taught me a great deal. In fact, for those of you in linguistics, Noam Chomsky was in the information group then, so I got an appreciation. And now that I'm in the College of Communication, I uh, am very much more aware of linguistics and the roles that some of those people played. But the economics that I studied was really meant a great deal to me. I had Paul Samuelson and John Kenneth Galbraith and Les Thoreau and some other people, and it really made me feel very comfortable with the elite. And one thing Sloan Fellowship gave me that nothing else has given me before then, was the opportunity to go around the world and meet the leaders of American industry and European industry and world industry. And we got a chance to meet the Supreme Court of the United States. There, it's limited to 40 people, the Sloan Fellowship, and it's a, I recommend it to anybody who really wants to get a tremendous broad exposure in one year. You get a degree out of it, too. You know, people ask me, how did I get, why did I get so many degrees? I haven't got the funniest, foggiest idea. But in my opinion, Everybody I know is thinking all the time. You can't avoid it. You cannot avoid thinking even if you try. Uh, I know people who say, I'm not going to think, and they do. They, they, don't really, they still think. They think about not thinking. Uh, but everybody's thinking all the time, and everybody uh, can really analyze things just as well as I can. And everybody learns every day. You're different today because of yesterday, and you'll be different tomorrow because of today. Neosynapsogenesis occurs in the brain. If I have time, I'm going to get into the brain here a bit, because I have been doing some work in the brain. But everybody learns every day, and the only thing different that I've done that I know from other people is I collected degrees along the way. So that it is, when a student tells me, you know, I can't go to school that long, you can't avoid it. Everybody's going to go to school all their life whether they want to or not. And if you might as well get credit for it, and it makes it much nicer in later years, because people believe you know something. Uh, <laughs> you don't have to really know anymore, and I don't believe I know any more than anybody else that's lived as long as I have. But they don't, not other people don't seem to know that yet. That's all right. Anyway, when I was at, uh, uh, 
I went from there, uh, I'd studied Johns Hopkins. The president of Hopkins flew up to Boston and the vice president for uh, medical affairs, and they invited me down to Hopkins to be dean for management and resources and professor of radiology, which I did. While we were down there, I was teaching management for medical schools for the Association of Medical Colleges, along with some of the faculty at MIT, and uh, that was a lot of fun. And then the night of the Saturday Night Massacre, on October 20th of 1973, when uh, Cox was fired by Nixon, because I remember the date really well. There were some people in that, there were great political arguments with that group. And we were teaching in Terrytown, New York. And of all the people who come by, there was Andy Hunt and Don Weston. And they were there learning uh, management of medical schools. And I was talking to them about, they were starting a medical school at Michigan State. They said they'd already started one. And I said, ooh, that's very nice. I'm delighted Michigan State's having a medical school. I was very excited about that prospect. And then they explained some of the ideas, that they were going to teach people to uh, do what doctors do. And I knew from practicing medicine, that'd be nice to know. It, when I went to medical school, we were began, all of our professors got their money from the research grants, and they were studying medicine, studying disease. And so rather than become just a student of disease, maybe they ought to set a curriculum around what doctors do with time. And I said, oh, that's a good idea. So they said, we, haven't, we got a problem. We don't have a radiology department. And then I, they said, come on out and give us some advice. So I came out here, and uh, I met with Cliff Wharton. Well, I found out not only didn't they have an ex a radiology department, they didn't have a modern x-ray machine. And then when I found out after that, they didn't have any money. <laughs> and that combination, that, was, that would have been a real barrier. But what they did have that no one else had as much of was opportunity. And that's all I really needed, because I was by that time pretty confident that I could get by and make it any place I'd go. So I decided I'd come out here. And my agreement with the trustees, and I did meet with the trustees then, essentially was that I would furnish the building and the equipment, and that they would furnish the land. And uh, it worked out pretty well for a long time. They were supposed to let me go my own and merry way, but they didn't really do that. And uh, now it's, uh, we've, it's been able to build up into something that's kind of fun. In fact, it's been a fun for a number of years, and it may even be useful. Actually, I think that uh, you can do things at Michigan State you cannot do elsewhere. Uh, the degrees of freedom were absolutely fantastic. We were not hidebound by tradition that other people had set before I got here, because nobody knew what radiology was, really, and it was whatever I did. And that gave me great degrees of freedom. Uh, and I did a lot of different things. I got a chance to get involved with agriculture, with, with a whole bunch of colleges. In fact, over the years, we've done a lot. Uh, over the past, since I've been here, I've got very active with a global perspective. I've been working in maybe 50 different countries and had a chance to really do uh, speaking tours in China, India, Japan, Korea, Thailand, Australia, France. I've been consultants for a variety of governments. Spent a lot of time in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, and we've done work for Australia. Then I worked for Adams in Action. We had an agreement that we would uh, furnish people knowledge of nuclear things if they wouldn't build the bomb. So they sent a bunch of us around the world with swimming pool reactors, and we would, in pretty remote places, they weren't about to build the bomb anyway, but we did learn a lot, uh, and we did have a chance to learn a lot of different cultures. And it is so rich to appreciate human diversity. In some of these countries, we would be well briefed by the State Department, and I really learned a lot. I got so interested in the diversity of the human experience, how very different people see how people see the world very differently. And that's a richness that I think Americans don't have enough of. In appreciation, there's many ways you can see the world. And we don't necessarily have the ownership of the right way to see it. In fact, everybody out there teaches you something. Well, I, got, I came back. I was chairman of the Liaison Committee on Medical Education, which credits all the medical schools. And the book that says what it is to be a medical school uh, happened to have my name on it, because I was chair at the time it was written. So I got a chance to um, go around the world and help people set up medical schools. They thought I knew something about it. There wasn't a requirement that I did know. Well, we were trying to close a medical school that I thought deserved being closed. And we were being sued, and I was pretty angry. And I would complain a great deal about lawyers at the meetings. And one of the persons on the committee was a judge from Arizona. And she, a very nice lady, but she and I had some major debates. I thought lawyers were really dishonest because they were suing us for doing a noble cause. And what happened after that was um, 
she, uh, one day when we were in Washington, she said, Jim, I got to go to the White House this morning. I have an appointment at 10 o'clock. I said, we don't have time for you to take those vacations. You can do that on your own time. And she said, no, I'm going to see the president. I got real impressed with that. And, <laughs> and she came back at the noontime and very, very nervous and things. And she said, uh, the least I'll get out of this is a federal judgeship. She was a judge in Arizona at the time. Her name was Sandra O'Connor. And she wrote, she wrote my, my letter to get me into law school, and I didn't have any problem going down to Ann Arbor. They accepted me. <laughs> well, I had a little problem going there, but uh, I drove down there for 500 trips. And Cecil Mackey had the, the courage to let me do that because not everyone thought that would be very nice. I'm working full-time here and down there full-time too. And it worked out all right for me. I enjoyed it. And law was not bad to know. And now that I'm a lawyer, I'm no longer mad at lawyers. Now... Since the past few years, we've gotten quite, an, quite a uh, portfolio in the radiology enterprises. We've taken on the Department of Anatomy. We've taken on the Department of, Division of Sports Medicine. Now we have the Division of Sports Nutrition. We get some interesting people in this thing. Sports Nutrition, we got Stella Cash. We may know, she's head of the alumni now. So we get very diversified programs. Then recently, we've taken on physical therapy, and I'm honored to see them here. Uh, they're here tonight. Physical therapy are here, and I acknowledge that they're here. And then the m most recent was communicative sciences and disorders. And it used to be called audiology and speech, and I've learned a great deal about that. Now, many people have been very, very good to me. In fact, I've been telling people lately, it's like taking a victory lap around a stadium. If you live long enough, people begin to treat you quite nice. Uh, and, you know, I've been around so long that people are being nice, and they have been nice for a long time as far as I'm concerned, but they may not realize how much more I appreciate what everyone does for me. I appreciate the students inviting me tonight, and thank you, Chris, for the leadership you're providing for the student body and being able to have me here tonight. I also appreciate my family. Uh, I have two daughters and two sons. The oldest of each sex is a physician, the youngest of each sex is a lawyer, and 12 grandchildren, six girls and six boys, two of whom are here tonight. But this morning when I got up, and I was gonna give this talk tonight, and I don't generally worry about talks, but this one was kind of, you know, the last lecture. What does that mean? <laughs> and I told Luana that I'm not going to die for the students. I like them a lot. <laughs> but I'm, I'm not, this, the last guy to give this, uh, Randy Pausch, died. And that's really a real commitment to the job. I'm committed, but not that committed. But anyway, I, uh, I, I have, uh, this morning when I got up, I had an email with a note from my grandson. Eddie J. Pochin, which is my name, Edward J. Pochin, uh, and he gave me a wonderful note that really meant a lot to me. I would read it to you, but it, I'm not going to, but it was the kind of thing that makes everything else worthwhile. Family and students are really what matters to me, and you can learn so much from the students you teach if you give yourself half a chance. Now, I've got a list of recommended readings that you're all welcome to look at, it's, uh, it's what I, th I read and use. You'll find in there I've got the Koran and the Bible and the Indian, the Hindu uh, book too. I try to cover, learn what I can from everybody. And it's amazing how different people can teach you a lot. But what I wanted to do now is have some things and reflections on some of the things that I've learned in these years. Decisions. Past decisions make us what we are today. Our future depends upon the decisions we make today. And I tell that to students all the time. When they study these decision analysis courses, the textbook we use is the newspaper. The best course I ever had was in law school with Bob Drynan, who'd been on the Watergate impeachment panel. And uh, Reverend Drynan, he was a Jesuit priest. Who the, the Pope made him leave the uh, Congress. Uh, so he went and taught law school. And he came to Michigan for a summer course and taught a course called Legislation. How do you make rules people will live by? And when you think about law, that's all it is, is rule making and rule breaking. I became an expert in the latter. Uh, but but it is a, uh, uh, it's a wonderful way to look at that. And what we do in this class is, in decision class, we just use the newspapers as the textbook. Because every newspaper article, someone's making a decision. And you can teach people how to make decisions. False positives, false negatives, all the quantifying things, just from what you can read in the newspaper. That's the same way I learned law at least the most important law class I had. Well, when you learn about decisions, I have coined a phrase that I think conjured up my model of what I've seen some governments do like ours 
in the past many years, which I've termed the arrogance of ignorance. Bad decisions come from failing to realize what you do not know. And that's a line that I like to use because I think it's so important that you have to know the limits of what you know if you're going to make any decisions. And if you think you know an answer, and if you have a unique belief that you're, you have the truth when no one else around you has it, or trying to convince other people that your unique truth is the only possible truth, then you've got a problem. I define truth as the absence of uncertainty. And it always exists. Uncertainty does. Information is defined as diminished uncertainty, diminished randomness. That's how Shannon defined information. That's what Schrodinger thought of when he thought moving on from physics to biology. And I've, I don't know how many even know about this, but that's how we got to understand what DNA was all about. Truth being the absence of uncertainty, truth and perfection will always be pursued, but they won't be possessed. Because all you, if you, as soon as you think you know the answer, you will limit your ability to learn anything about it. And the pleasures of keeping an open mind are greater than the pleasures of thinking you have discovered the truth. That's something I tell the students. All decisions are made under conditions of uncertainty, and all decisions under uncertainty have an error rate. We should learn from those errors. And what I have studied in law, we study a great deal of error making and, and the, how people make errors and what we can do to diminish the frequency of errors. But people are still going to make them, and we're never going to have perfect truths in things we do. As soon as we think we have the truth, we can't learn anymore about it. And that would be a tragedy. And when someone comes and says, I know a truth that's right for you, and you believe me or I'll kill you, I think that's offensive. Uh, <laughs> there are people who do that, you know, and I've, this is the kind of thing. Now, the other thing I teach a lot about is time management, because many people can't understand how you can get so much done. I don't find it difficult at all. I really don't think I work very hard, nor have I ever worked hard. And one of the things I do every day, and I get this from Candide, Voltaire's Candide, Today is the best of all possible worlds. You remember Pangloss, who would go around and say it's the best of all possible worlds, no matter how terrible things were. And they would say it's, the, say it's the best of all possible worlds. Well, in my opinion, today is the best day I've got today, and I say that every day. I wake up in the morning thinking that because I actually believe it. It is the best day. If it's raining, it's still the best day I've got, and I'm going to enjoy it and make the most of it because it, when it's gone, it isn't coming back. And if you make the most of every day, it's amazing how much more you can get done. The only thing that we own as people is our time. And the only thing I have of value is my time. And that's my only thing that I own because everything else is potentially removable from me. I'm the only one that can remove my time. At the, uh, you should spend time on things where you can make a difference because so many people fret about things they can't do anything about and that's a waste of time. And since that's the only thing you have you can own, you might as well make the best of it. At the end of the day, reflect on how your time was spent and do that for five to ten minutes a day and then put that day behind you. That's what William Osler said in The Way of Life. It's a great essay. Sir William Osler was the f dominant physician in the last century. Uh, he, was at, he started Hopkins Medical School. He was a Northfield professor at Oxford and he came out of Canada. But he and he wrote the first big textbook. It was the major, the only textbook in medicine for 50 years in the United States. Really, everyone used it. But he did write this book, Way of Life, a lecture to medical students. And I try to have the students learn the same thing. And subsequently, I've learned that the Japanese have a same motto called Kaizen, which is a better way every day. At the end of the day, figure out what you could do tomorrow better, and then put that day behind you, never to worry about it again but find out what you can do better. And if you try to improve a little bit every day by taking the moments to reflect on how you spent that day, it's amazing how rapidly you'll get ahead of other people. Because many people tell me they're too busy to think. In fact, you go around to people and say, have you sp spent time thinking about today? Do you keep a journal? One of the other things you can learn is to keep a journal. I haven't done it, but I hear that it's a great thing to do. <laughs> And the reason I think it's a great thing to do, because I've seen be people be able to take notes out of their journals. I've got a very good friend, Harm Dublay. I don't know if you know him or not. He's the world's foremost geographer. He's a Hannah professor here now. And Harm is a magnet. He writes a lot of books. His book on geography sells some 100,000 copies a year, which is pretty darn good. Uh, and he's, he really is a great guy, but he keeps a journal. And he can then write a book 
years later about how we spent the, the time. If I could have done that here, I could come back with this journal and give you an awful lot of things that really I wouldn't have to just guess about the past because the past is merely a memory that I have. It isn't necessarily a reality. Uh, in my opinion, learning is a prerequisite to improvement. And everybody's going to learn something every day. The most common barrier to learning is thinking you know the answer. The more I think I know, the less I'll be able to learn. And it's so refreshing to wake up and realize how little we all know and how much fun it is to try to learn more. The next topic I'd like to talk about is leadership and management. I've taken a, really I've been interested in the philosophy of management and leadership and I've shared that with the students. Management is the art and science of getting the job done. Kind of neat, isn't it? Very simple. Man, the art and science of getting the job done, whatever the job is. You manage your time, you get the job done. You have things you want to do to accomplish it, you have to have some management. Leadership is different in that it's the art and science of getting the job done with and through people. And that distinction to me is what it, my life's all about because I couldn't get by without a lot of other people to do what I, people think I've done and do, or do. I have to depend on other people and that's much more fun. It's much more fun to integrate yourself into other people's lives and to really listen to them and be aware of them and use the, to your advantage and to their advantage your ability to work together. People can learn to work together no matter how much they initially hate each other. Uh, and it is, I've had, a, my whole life I've had people who get upset with me and I've been able to make peace. In fact, I've not found anyone I couldn't make peace with without even trying too hard once you let them know how you really feel about other people. Uh, my business, what am, I, what am I trying to do? I'm in the business of producing human capital. A lot of people, you know, they may produce widgets or cars or something like that. But anybody who's a teacher, what you're trying to do is enhance the value of your students to themselves and to others for the rest of their lives. And that makes such a tremendous difference. Because 30 years after you taught a class, if it means something to the students, they'll come back and say good things to you make you feel warm and tingly. And that's a real investment in that what happens is they teach other people. So that's one form of immortality is the investment in human capital. And every single day, I look around to see how can I help the, somebody do better today. And as a physician, you do that, and as a teacher, you do that. How can I increase the value of this person to themselves and others? And that's what I've told the students many times. Uh, this is what we do in class. The reason I have a class here today is because we didn't have class this afternoon. And <laughs> well, I had a lot of other things to do. I do get pretty busy, but... Uh, that's not the only reason we have them here. They're really very good students and we've gotten to know each other pretty well. One other thing I'd say is that if anybody does better, we all do better. And you know, that's not widely appreciated. People are competitive with one another. I don't go into competition with people very much. In fact, I try not to compete because I would never want to have anyone else feel lesser for my actions. What I would like to see done is that have them do better. And whatever I can do to help them do better, well, I will be rewarded for. It is not a zero-sum game. Life is not zero-sum. If anybody does better, we all do better. And the idea that I have to beat someone else to do better is ludicrous. And that's a very common perception people seem to have. Uh, I think we've got to respect that everybody is thinking all the time and everybody has ideas worth considering. And as soon as you shut off the diversity of input from your analytic thinking about people and why you spend your time, you've really lost a tremendous opportunity. The way you get your best opportunities in life is take people who are most polarly opposite from you and have them move you a little toward the middle. Uh, it's, it is fantastic how people can change how you view the world. Anybody can do that to you. And that's always rewarding to me. Every time, I, and I've changed a lot. I'm delighted with the fact that I can still change at my age. Uh, that's a, a fantastic opportunity for me because it's fun. It's a new me every day if I really think about it. In fact, it is a new me every day. It's a new you every day. You know, you're not the same person as yesterday. You're different today because of what you've learned today. Or what you learned yesterday changed you from what you were the day before. I can see that's how we can all improve each other and we've got to be able to do that. Now, the major thing in management, oh, uh, the other thing is, the world is full of unmet friends. 
I am inordinately gregarious. I will go to any new city and make an awful lot of friends. And I'll learn a language really fast by asking people, how do you say this, how do you say that? And then I tell them, right, Don? Yeah. We went through China and I began to talk the Chinese language without ever understanding what tone meant. Uh, because I, I just tried to express it the way they were talking. And I wasn't very good at it, but I, they really appreciated the fact I was paying enough attention to them. In fact, when I go to Japan, my Japanese business card says, a devotee of, Musa, of Musashi. And Musashi is the greatest of the samurai warriors. He battled in a Shikigura plane in 1676, is where he made his, that's before they had their capital moved to Edo. And Musashi was the greatest samurai warrior. Everybody I know in Japan knows about Miyamoto Musashi. Now, we don't. If we're really going to pay attention to the Japanese, we can learn from knowing what they think is important. And actually, this guy is a, re it's a remarkable story. Eiji Oshikawa wrote, it's really a, a tremendous uh, epic journal about the, 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 what Musashi did. When he finished, he became a writer, and he wrote a greenness show, The Book of Five Rings. It's a book we used at MIT Sloan School studying management because it's how to win. Neat subject if you're going to be in business. In fact, it's a neat subject if you're going to be in life, and you can do that by respecting other people. And that's not always widely appreciated. Now, Musashi is one of the things that's on my business card, and the other thing on the business card, a devotee of Soseki Natsumi. Natsumi picture was on the thousand yen note until recently. I saw they just took it off. But his picture was on the thousand yen note. When I see a thousand yen note, it's got a guy's picture on it. I say, I wonder who this guy is. So I asked around and I found who he was. So he was an author. He was the Mark Twain of Japan. He wrote a book called uh, I Am a Cat. It was the worldview as seen from the kitchen cat. What a great book. I bet you a lot of you haven't read that, but it's worth reading. But another book he wrote, it's like our Huck Finn or Huck Finn more, is Bochin, and that sounded like me. So I went all over Japan, and I went to Bochin baths and everything. I found out all about the, what the history of Bochin, but Bochin was the naughty boy. Was the, that's the Japanese translation. They knew him as the naughty boy. And I, the, my name is quite proper over there, uh, and so I get along fine with him. But when I began to really pay attention, and I went to every haunt, every place Musashi had murdered somebody, I went to visit. And so I was able to really express an interest in their culture and their persona. And in doing so, I have had many, many great and rewarding experiences in Japan. And you know, you can do that with any country. The world is just full of unmet friends. And it is fantastic to go out and find out how they're seeing a different world than you are. That's what you learn from. Now, I'm going to talk very briefly, and I've got about uh, 10 minutes left. I wanted to talk a bit about what I've been working on the past few years. University of brain function, and then it has to do with applied genomics. And I wanted to share with you uh, about Schrodinger. My father came from Vienna. Schrodinger was a guy who in 1926 went to the Solvay conferences. At the Solvay conferences, they got a bunch of physicists together and chemists primarily, a lot of chemists, and they figured out uh, the nature of nature. It resulted in, among other things, the atomic bomb. There's a great book by Rhodes called The Making of the Atom Bomb, which I urge you all to read. It is a fantastic book. Uh, I had all my children read. In fact, I had my children read two books primarily. Well, three books. But I had them read a lot of books, actually. Uh, <laughs> one of them was The Making of the Atom Bomb. I bought it for the kids. And then I bought another book called Siddhartha, which I'll get to, I hope. Uh, and those are the two major things. But the making of the atom bomb is, it was a great book to learn from. Well, Schrodinger, when he did that, he said, you know, now that we've discovered the nature of nature, let's look for something important. Let's look for the nature of life. And he came up with the idea that life was a code. In fact, I even have his, some of his notes in here in case I had to get, remember him. I don't really think I have to. Because what life is, uh, is a code that we have stored in us. And we store memory in, our, in human beings, in fact, all life, in two ways. We store it in our genome, and we store it in our brain. And the human brain is far more impressive machine than the genome. It changes while you watch, and synapses are altered to create learned memories, and whereas the genome changes more slowly than a glacier. 
The pruning of neural networks in our brains is vital to proper function of the brain. And with genomes play out the messages in predetermined ways with comparatively little flexibility. And both of these storage places for information are where people become people. And humanity, to be human, requires the ability to communicate in essence. I mean, the humanity difference between people and other forms of life is our capacity to communicate and our capacity for reason. Not that all human beings can communicate, and surely not all human beings are really reasonable. Some of them disagree with me, uh, which is very interesting. The concept of the code started with Aristotle, and he called it entelechy, and you know, he wondered, in that acorn they stored a tree. How did they ever do that? Where's that tree hidden in that acorn? Which is a great kind of subject. Where's that chicken hidden in that egg? And when you begin to think about in those days how people thought, and then you begin to reflect a bit about how much we know about it today, which we do know quite a bit more about it, but the principles are the same. What was stored in the egg, what was stored in the acorn was information which was the information that could be used at. And there were a number of people in 1943 that really moved this whole dimension down. Life consists of two very different skills, the ability to replicate and the ability to create order. Life does not defy the second law of thermodynamics. It says that in a closed system, everything tends from order to disorder because life is not a, in a closed system. Living creature, this is Schrodinger's quote, living creature drink orderliness from the environment. And that's one of the things that makes things different. Well, Schrodinger gave these things, lectures on what is life in Dublin. And I know someone who took that course there. Robert Steiner was a dear friend of mine. He was the first professor of radiology in the United Kingdom. And another student there was Francis Crick. And Francis Crick, coming out of the physics thing, said, my goodness, you know, uh, there's something to this. What is life as being a code? And they began to see where that code could be, and that finally came up with DNA. And the whole business about how genes work and genes get expressed, uh, I think, is a fantastic subject. And it, what, what makes us each unique, among other things, we have stored in our brains and stored in our genome information that makes each of us different from each other. And we can develop a way to better understand it than we have. I've got a... I usually give slides, but not to give slides was really hard tonight. I don't ever give a talk without having all those slides up there, but this is a talk I'm just talking. I guess that happens sometimes when you speak. Uh, but one of my slides I have now, I talk about bacteria, and uh, in the, uh, the massively competitive world of bacteria, uh, uh, we, never, we never came under such uh, competition. And one of the slides I say, support bacteria, it's the only culture some people have. <laughs> now, moving on to the purpose of medicine. You know, I ask the students, what's the purpose of medicine? I ask all the students, what's your purpose? And I say, what are you trying to do? And that's a wonderful question for people. What are you trying to do? Why are you spending today the way you've chosen to spend it? Why are you doing that? And many people can't answer that very well because they haven't really taken the time to think. If you do ask people what you're trying to do, what is the purpose of medicine? Well, we used to have people tell us the purpose of medicine was to save lives. Well, boy, the frequency of death per person is the same no matter how much we invest in medicine. That's not gonna be a good investment. In fact, a guy calls me up once and he says, I'm the president of the American Institute of Architects. I was, well, that was impressive. I don't know anything about him, but that's impressive. And he said, the American Institute of Architects board, and we want you to give our annual oration next year. And it's, you got nine months to figure out what to say. And this, uh, we want you to talk on the future. And I said, what would you want me to do that for? And they said, because the people think you know something about the future. Now, I'd done some work in forecasting and some arithmetic, mathematics of forecasting, but it doesn't mean that I knew a damn thing about the future more than anybody else. But I was perfectly prepared to talk on it because I figured nobody else did either. <laughs> <laughs> so... It wouldn't bother me to get up and give a speech on it, so I was pretty impressed. And over the summer, I began to get these advertising for this great talk on the future. It was going to be given at the American Institute of Architects. And a big crowd's going to be there, and they were going to pay me a moderate amount of money for that. And I said, oh, i got to do something. So I went to see their building in Philadelphia. It's a very nice building. And I look and say, oh, that's architect building. 
And I went inside and they had all these fancy things. I said, Ooh, that's very nice. But what am I going to tell them about the future? What do I know? And so I really reflected on it quite a little bit. And I came up with the idea that what's the purpose of architecture? Well, they, pr they try to build things for immortality. They try to build things that are going to last. Look at the cathedrals of the Middle Ages. They still are around and we can appreciate them. And what were they put there for? Why was the purpose of building cathedrals? Well, the purpose of building cathedrals was to have one way to get immortality. Ooh, they were buying immortality with that portion of the resource allocation. So then I said, hmm, how much did people put into buying those cathedrals in the Middle Ages? And I went on the net and I said, what percentage of gross domestic product went into the purchase of the cathedral at Reims? Someone comes back to me and says, What's the gross domestic product in France in 1300? Nobody had the foggiest idea. So I used that for that. I used an, a uh, human uh, surrogate. How many people it took to build a cathedral? Because they have all the name, the list of people it took to build it. And what percentage of the total human effort went into building cathedrals compared to what we do today? One of the things I found out, I said, how are we buying immortality today? Well, we're trying to save lives at life's terminus, which are intensive care units. And architects are designing them. So I gave this talk, The Cathedrals of Medicine. And trying to look at the different ways of going out and buying immortality. Purchasing something that will be here after you exist. You know, when I'm, I go out and talk to uh, everybody, and I'm a pretty talkative guy. And, uh, but I, uh, the guy's laying some rocks. At a, at a, we build a little garden next to our office. And that garden, I like the garden a lot. It reminds me of when I liked gardens, and I still do. And, uh, but this guy was laying a rock there. And I go by and I always ask the workers, what are you thinking? I ask everybody, what are they thinking? It's quite amazing what people will tell you. But this guy said to me, you know, Doc, he says, he looks at that rock, he says, look at that rock. I've got to get it just in the right position. If I do this just right, 50 years, someone's going to come by and say, someone who spent that afternoon on such and such a date made a difference the way he put that rock in there. That man was buying immortality. He said, long after you and I are dead, this rock's going to be here. If I do it just right, it's going to be better than if I do it wrong. I don't know if there's a right or wrong way to put the rock in. But the idea, he was looking to where he's going to, his work of that day would be in 50 years. And I found that to be very impressive. Because bricklayers get immortality just like teachers do. The best way to find immortality is teaching. The best way to find it is to work with students. And the thing that's really important to me are the students. And I think the students know that. Maybe that's why they had me come and give this talk tonight. Because uh, they are very important to me. They are so stimulating. And every one of you should be, appreciate the tremendous rich thing we have at Michigan State or any university where you can expose yourself to a bunch of bright young people who are going to be the future. They're going to be your immortality. They'll be here long after you're gone. Like my grandchildren, they're going to be part of me when I'm gone. It's a residuum of my genome. But it's the kind of thing people do like, the idea of what's going to happen to me after I'm dead. And if you just have the capacity to believe that the people you've been able to make life better will live on after you, that is the most rewarding thing you can do. And I find that to be a great reward, and the students know that because I've talked to them about this before. In fact, most everything you heard tonight you had in class before, didn't you? Not quite. I gave them a little more, little more neuroscience tonight than you've gotten in class. But you've been with me now two years. Ooh, that's a long time. Uh, and yeah, most of these students are in the sophomore class. I have two of the freshman class, right? Three. Three. Oh, three of the freshman class. Yeah, that's very nice. I'm glad you made it. Uh, and we've had a uh, wonderful time as the students and I, I really enjoy it. In fact, I really look forward to the days of teaching. And perhaps that's why, Chris, you had me come tonight. Now, I would like to uh, conclude this and have an opportunity to ask questions. I did say, I don't think I said things that are going to be highly controversial, although uh, it's hard for me not to. I didn't even try not to be controversial. I just wanted to share some of the things I've been thinking about and uh, give you a chance to appreciate what our students get exposed to. Some of it's good and some of it may not be so good. And some of you have taught classes with me, and I really appreciate everything you've done. But all of you have taught me in one way or another every day. And all I have to do is have my mind open up enough to do it. And I see many friends in the audience whom I do know, although I can't see out there real well, I have a feeling there are some people out there that are quite friendly. Uh, 
<laughs> and I am quite friendly myself, so that works out pretty well. <clears throat> I would like to draw this to a close and really thank you, Chris, because it's just the time to do it. Thank you and the students, uh, ASMSU. Uh, we work, uh, the li Student Liaison Committee to the board is something that works uh, with the faculty liaison to the board. And now I've been on the faculty liaison to the board an excessive period of time, and thank God this is my last year. Uh, there's got to be some term limits to that. But uh, I have had plenty of opportunities to do a lot of things here, and uh, I've really enjoyed my ride at Michigan State. I am not retiring. Everyone thinks this is a signal that I'm going to retire. Uh, even Luana uh, did mention that when she announced this at the faculty council, or academic council, wasn't she? She did announce that that uh, I'm not going to be retiring. Uh, I plan to be here for many more years. I'm enjoying it immensely, and I really do appreciate all of you coming out tonight on a rainy night. Uh, I would like to have anybody have questions, and the students, do you have any questions? Because you frequently ask me questions after we've talked a bit, and you've got them all primed. No, they haven't actually, I don't think, did you? No. You didn't prepare any questions, no. <laughs> we talked about them coming here tonight, though. Now. Uh, does anybody have, I'm prepared to answer any question you might have. I've had the chance to talk for a full hour, and I could talk many more hours, but I'm not going to tonight. Uh, we want to get to see, I don't really want to get to see that debate, though. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so bad. You know, polarization in politics is, is, I find, disaffecting. I don't like it too much. I don't like people who are not doing reason. All you got to do is, you know, human beings should reason together. And I don't see everybody being as reasonable as they might spend their time. We ought to think about how to handle some really big problems in this world. And we're not spending our time doing that as much as we should. Uh, more of it is polarization. But anyway, uh, any questions from anybody? If not, oh yeah. I've been in your garden and I know it's the statue of Thomas Jefferson. Yeah. You some sure. We got Jefferson's statue there because when we went out to do the sculpturing of the bronze, the guy that did Hannah did me here. And I had nothing to do with him doing me other than I sat for 50 hours out at Berkeley, California. Nice place, but, uh, and a nice guy, really nice guy. And he and I began to talk philosophy. And I was listening on my iPod to uh, Gottlieb's uh, pre-Socratic philosophers. And so, and this artist really got into that with me. We talked a lot about all the various pre-Socratic philosophers. And he said, I can't capture all of you on this, on this image, so I want to capture more of you uh, by having, and so I had the students hand in things that they heard me say in class, and they put, he put that and carved it in marble. You know, when a guy says, I'm going to put a, make a bronze statue of you, it may be around a thousand years or so, that's kind of immortality. And then he says, I want you to tell me what you want carved in marble under your bronze. Whew, what do you tell him? I had no idea what to tell him, but the students helped me with that, as they usually do. Well, he did Thomas Jefferson, and he did Hannah for here, and after he did the, one of the bronze of me over there in the radiology thing, he did uh, Margaret Thatcher. But he had that Thomas Jefferson statue that I really appreciated. He did it for the sesquicentennial of uh, University of Virginia, or Jefferson, and uh, they didn't take it as they did a, he did a McKay, a small one. And so it, I could buy it, and I had to get permission from the University of Virginia to do it. But it's there, I think it's beautiful. Jefferson, as a horticulturalist, really embodies my idea of good spirit. Because he became quite a Renaissance person, a cosmopolitan, a, a polymath, and always was a polymath. At the same time, he started out in horticulture. And I'm not as much of a polymath, but I did start out in horticulture. And uh, to have him in the garden there means a lot to me. So uh, that's why he's there. Any more questions? I have yeah. You just said uh, you wanted to explain to us why you have Herman Hesse and Siddhartha on there. Pardon? About uh, Herman Hesse and Siddhartha. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Those of you who haven't, we got a few minutes. Can I do yeah, five going. minutes? That's fine. Um, Herman Hesse and Siddhartha, that is, Siddhartha is one of the great books I had all my children read when they were teenagers. Uh, some of them even appreciated it. Uh, <laughs> but Siddhartha is a book about Siddhartha Gautama Buddha, really, and it teaches me 
a very important lesson that I use to teach a lot. And it's the best book on power theory that I know. Power is defined as the ability to influence someone else's behavior. Nobody can influence your behavior if you don't let them do so. Siddhartha went around the world and went around his world in India and actually uh, after partying and up and having all kinds of great sport, he concluded, which is a lesson that's easy to take, that he was having a lot of trouble figuring out his needs from his wants. And let me just, go, let me just quickly divert. Economics <coughs> is the study of value. Value is defined as the potential energy between a have and a want. It's the tension that exists between when you want something you don't have and you sometimes are willing to pay for it. Anytime there's a transaction in the marketplace, you go buy an orange from a grocer for a dollar. You and the grocer have a conflict of values. The grocer wants the dollar more and you want the orange more. That's a very simple understanding of economics. But Siddhartha, after getting to have everything he could possibly want, he finally decided he really doesn't need very much. In fact, he said, I can stand, I can wait, and I can fast. And as long as I can do that, I don't need anything else. And once you come to the realization that things you think you may want, like material goods, you really become much more powerful. Because if you don't need them, you don't have to modify your behavior to get them. And you can do what you think is right, not what someone else wants you to do. And you don't have to get pressured to move in a direction that you wouldn't move, but for the right, that you think it's the right direction to go for some other interest. Uh, and the classic thing is at the end, you know, he goes the ooms, and as you go down the, the river moving along, how the river changes all the time and it stays the same. There's a great deal of philosophy in that book, so I found that book to be very good. Siddhartha wrote, I mean, Herman Hesse wrote other work, Steppenwolf's another great book. Uh, there are many great writers. I passed out, we have passed out, haven't we? Uh, you got a reading list. That's just a modest reading list of things I've used and I find very reinforcing. And one of the key books is Siddhartha. Uh, and there's a lot of other great books in there, but th that has had a big impact on me because I became much more powerful when I was aware that I didn't need everything I thought I needed. In fact, most people who go out to, I give, I give lectures on the futility of materialism. You know, in law, property is defined as the right to exclude someone else from use. Well, that's kind of strange. If I don't, everything I got, I like someone else to use it when I'm not using it. So I don't have a need to exclude others from using what I've got. And I'd rather share it and make some use of anything I own. And so why do I have to worry about owning something? And there would be, if I grabbed material goods, piles of gold, what kind of nonsense is that? What, what's the value if I just go get things? It's much more important if I can help build other people up. They're going to really add value to me all the rest of my life and their lives too. So that's what I find from Siddhartha. Are there any more questions? I can wax on for questions. Yeah. I was in general practice in Grand Rapids, and I really did enjoy that immensely. But the person who helped me the most was Ken Fellows, who was the radiologist. And I would send patients to him, and he would come back and he'd say, Jim, this is a fracture we, you and I can handle. Or no, this one we better send to an orthopedic surgeon. He knew more general medicine than I ever knew. And he was so good, he'd say, this pneumonia we can treat. Or he'd say, this pneumonia I think we better send off and call in a specialist. Well, you know, when you're in general practice, and I was seeing 50 patients a day in the office, so I'd see every possible thing that came in the door, and I didn't know how to handle a lot of that. Radiologist was the guy that helped me the most. And so I said, ooh, that's a pretty good thing. And besides, I didn't have to give up any field of medicine to do that. I could still think about the brain and the heart, and I could think about bones, and I could think about obstetrics. I could think about anything I wanted to. <coughs> I could be, still be a total physician. And the idea that I don't see patients, I see patients all the time now. People come to my office every day. So I don't have any problem seeing patients. Uh, and so I find radiology extremely rewarding. Now, I was very lucky. I got into radiology when I was looking at chest x-rays. 
And I trained with a guy that was the father of the chest X-ray, Felix Fleischner. And so I had a chance to be at radiology when it was just we did X-ray films. We don't do that anymore. The field has been, because it was applied technology in medicine, and primarily applied information acquisition in medicine, it really did make a tremendous growth in the years I've been in it. I've been involved with the development of nuclear medicine. I was there when it started, and I've been involved with it ever since. And now it's PET scanning. Positron emission tomography was invented by one of our students, uh, Mike Phelps, at Washington University. We had the first medical cyclotron there. In fact, when they're talking about going to get the cyclotron here, we know we have a cyclotron that we're selling isotopes. We have a, and on this campus, we have a business uh, we're doing, producing radio pharmaceuticals from the cyclotron we bought. We have a cyclotron installed. We have probably the best equipped radiology facility in the nation here now because we're the only evergreen contractor with the General Electric Company. So we get the latest and greatest machines they make whenever, first. And so we have everything they make. Uh, it's really very good here. But radiology has been fantastic. But I was involved in the, in the development of PET scanning then ultrasound came along. I didn't do much in that, but I did a great deal when CT came around. I mean, let me just give you a minute about when computer tomography. We used to put air in the ventricles of the brain, and people would have bad headaches, and we put it in the spine, because that's the only way you could see where the ventricles of the brain were in order to look for brain tumors. It was really tough, hard on patients and hard on us. Well. They came along and they invited me, I was invited to give the keynote talk at the New Horizons talk at the Radiological Society in North America. 3,600 people in attendance and it's the only time they have the plenary session of all the radiology. So it's the top lecture you could give in my field. And I was really honored to do that. And it was a very big thing. I spent hundreds of hours preparing that talk. Much more than I did for tonight, I tell you. <laughs> uh, and I, I really worked on that. and. Uh, when I went to the meeting, they said, Jim, you know, this is a, uh, we've, we've got a paper submitted here, and this is the only time we have a plenary session of all 3,600 people. Uh, would you mind if we had a guy give five minutes at the end of your 40-minute talk on something that's just been submitted because none of us have, could believe it's true? And he showed the ventricles of the human brain without having to put air into the spine or having to stick a needle in. And it was so shocking to all of us, I thought it was fake. In fact, if he'd have applied for a research grant, he wouldn't have had it. But they did that with CT. And now it's gone. The new CT machines are fantastic. They've got the, in, in that many slices. I mean, and the doses are going way down. There's tremendous things we can do we couldn't do. Well, I was there when that got first presented. Then I was there when we had one of the first MR machines in the nation here at Michigan State. Uh, we had the third one that General Electric made. And now we have... Uh, the latest and greatest of their magnetic resonance devices. And MR came along, and I advised GE not to get into that. I sit with their advisory board, and I said, you're just doing CT, and that MR is not going to work. And by God, it did work. <laughs> so, but you never know. When we first started to do MR, we could see not only the ventricles, we could see the architecture of the brain in human beings, and it shocked us. We got so much enthralled by the neuroanatomy, being able to depict things in the brain that we could never see before, that uh, we wrote papers on all that stuff, and now it's way behind us. But I've had a chance to really have a big ride in radiology that I may not have had in other fields. Radiology has clearly grown the most of any part of medicine in the time I've been in it. So I was just lucky. But I picked it for the reason I said. You can still do anything you want to do. The nice thing about I can still be anything I want to be. And I tell this to the students, and this is one of the things they wrote me the last thing. The one thing they're impressed with, they don't have to make up their minds of what they're going to do the rest of their life. You never have to do that. You can always do anything you want to do. You're perfectly free to choose any time in your life. And I'm still able to choose. You don't have to get in a rut. And that's people, I think, when they close themselves in very narrowly and say, I'm just going to do this very narrow thing, you lose an awful lot, lot of opportunity to bridge other disciplines to transmute, to reach across, and to learn from other things. Harvey and I are a professor of physiology. And Har we, uh, you know, in physiology, I learned something about, um, I mean, I knew a little bit about physiology, but I learned a lot more about it if I'm theoretically teaching it or working in it. And you can learn about any subject. Al we, we took me off to 
to show people about soils. I don't know anything about, I took soil science when I was here, when I was in agriculture. But where, where did we go to? We went to the, uh, some big meeting where you had all the soil science people in crops and soil science. And I gave a talk on the magnetic residence of plant roots. They had never seen anything like that. And some careers, John Hallowen built a career doing magnetic resonance, or among other things, plant pathology, built it on doing some magnetic resonance studies. Many people have had a chance to expose the great, great range of opportunities at Michigan State that ordinarily, if you're hidebound by your discipline, you can't get done. And I don't feel the least bit hidebound. I'm even learning a little bit about communicative sciences. And it is one of the finest subjects I've ever had to get into. And they're very nice people over there. Isn't that right, Pam? <laughs> see, I can see some faces out there. Not very many, but I can. Some of you, I just got the light on you, right? I can tell who you are. Uh, well, anyway, I, I appreciate everybody coming out tonight. Uh, I'm, you know, I talk to the students. The interesting thing, the freshman students come for, or sophomores come for, was it an hour and a half class or something? And then we have right after that the freshman class, and they frequently stay for it. And so, you know, it's a long class, but they don't mind, and I don't mind, and we have quite a good time. We do. Right, Liz? Now, what do you have to say? You can say something, Liz. You're pretty outspoken in <laughs> class. <laughs> now that you're here, you should say something. Um, we do usually stay, and there is no downtime. There's no awkward silence. It's completely filled. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we constantly learn new things every day. And that's one of the best things I've learned from Dr. Pochin is that I can learn anything, anywhere, anytime, as long as I'm open to it and as long as that's what I want to do. Now, what do you have to say, Jay? Yeah. Um, oh, geez, let's see. That's kind of a hard lecture to follow. Um, OK, well, um, Hmm. You had a lot more time to think about this than I do. <laughs> I'm a lot older. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, the class is always a lot of fun. Um, Dr. Pochin, Dr. Weston, and Mr. Cooper, who are the, uh, the three people that frequently teach the class, always bring us new material. Um, they're always very open to our input, to our questions, and they're all, um, they're all very accomplished people with a lot to pass on to us. But I think, um, I think more than anything, it's that they discuss different issues with us, and they really try and help us um, bring out the knowledge that we already have inside us. And that's one of the well biggest said. parts of the class. And I think that most of the people, especially the sophomores, would agree that we've learned a lot more in Dr. Pochin's class than we have in a lot of our other classes. So it's been a great experience. Angie, you didn't sign up for the class, but you come anyway. Just anybody that wants to seems to walk in class, but you do, right? You come to class, and you're pretty, pretty loyal in coming, but you didn't sign up for the class, which is okay. What are you getting out of the class? Why do you keep coming? Because Liz made me. <laughs> <laughs> because Liz made her. That's nice. <laughs> Chris, do you have anything to say? You're not very quiet in class, or sometimes you are. Uh, I don't know. I like, I like learning about, like, the, a lot of times when you're given definitions, it's a, it's a different way of looking at things. Like, you could say, the, like you said, the ownership is the right to deny someone from using something or something like that. Like, I think... It's property. Or property, yeah. Like, looking at things different ways than people, other people are viewing them is uh, interesting. Now, the freshman, have you gotten anything out of the class? You've been there for three weeks or four weeks? Oh. Two months? Yeah, yeah, whatever. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I've definitely gotten way more than I expected to get out of it. Honestly, like when I first signed up for the class, I was expecting it to be just like a freshman one credit seminar, but um, it's, I mean, it's something that I'm going to remember for the rest of my life, I think. Um, I've really gotten a lot of life lessons and um, just like everyone else has said, like a whole new perspective on living life and going to college and learning and making decisions, so. It's definitely been a great experience for me. For a freshman seminar, that's very rewarding for me, I'll tell you. <laughs> Thank you very much. You guys have something to say over there? Two of you, you're not usually that quiet. <laughs> um, well, like, I have so many interests, and, like, it was really hard for me to pick, like, just one thing to go into. And I thought, like, everyone only focused on one field of study. But then you started telling stories about how, like, all this ridiculous stuff that you've done and, like, all these degrees, <laughs> all these degrees that you've 
degrees and you just never quit learning and like I just like just to see someone else who never focused on one area of study and just kept going on t just doing whatever you interested you was really refreshing and to hear that I never have to stop learning is nice. You can't stop even if you try. <laughs> I know people who think they've tried to stop learning, you can't avoid it. Lauren, what'd you get out of it? Motivation. Coming to class every week, it's just motivating seeing people who are so open-minded talking on such a broad topic like everyone else has said. And it's, like he just said, it's very refreshing as a, like an undergraduate <coughs> student here who gets frustrated with classes, but it's so motivating being around such distinguished people with such open minds and who just love learning. And like you said the other day, like there's no topic that you can't learn if, you're, if you know how to learn. So I guess what I'm taking out of this class is really learning how to learn and be open-minded. And that's all you can teach anybody in college, because the knowledge, the facts, they're going to disappear, but your process of being able to continually get new material is always going to be with you. And that's one of the things that I've found. I've had a lot of fun with it. I remember um, Alita asked you, she was in a freshman class, and she asked you why did she have to take calculus if she wanted to be an orthodontist, and you said, uh, there's going to be a lot of times when you're doing your job, but there's also a lot of time when you're not. And that's where the other learning comes from. I thought that was one of my favorite quotes. So, nice yeah, well, calculus is nice anyway. <laughs> Mathematics is really nice. <laughs> you know, it isn't, the courses are not relevant, really. It's just how you continue to learn them. Because you've got to be able to teach yourself everything. Whatever, whatever's going to be important when you're my age is going to be different than it is today. Tremendously different. And you're going to have to find a way to continually learn between then and now. And that's really fun if you know how to do it. Now, what did you get out of class? Oh, wow. Um, You've been pretty quiet in class, too, I noticed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've never met anyone with a more open mind than Dr. Pochin. But I don't know. And not to be ageist or anything, but it's hard to come by, you know, with someone with as much experience as you to, you know, <laughs> listen to someone our age. It's really... <laughs> I really do listen. Yeah, he keeps an open that mind. surprises my family. <laughs> <laughs> when we sit down for a lecture and uh, he's talking, we definitely learn something from him. But when we're speaking, he expects to learn, from, to learn something from us, and he admits that he does. But I, I don't know if he could learn much from us. <laughs> I, have, I do all the time. It's, everybody's learning from everybody else. Now, Chris, you've been working with me for just a little bit this time. Yeah. Roger's in the audience, though. He worked with me last year, a couple yeah, years. Right yeah, Roger did, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, what, what do you think of that? About this? Yeah. Well, the reason why we chose you for, at least why the academic assembly chose you, is because you were able to do this with the students, be able to get them involved, be able to get them to think, and be able to get them to flare their minds in ways that many professors are unable to do or have not been able to do. And being able to have this dialogue, it really is something special. And one of the things, at least a side comment that I'd like to make, at least about this tonight, is because I'm, uh, I'm going into politics myself, economics and politics. And it's kind of interesting because we have the debate coming on tonight at 9 o'clock. And it's, politics is a lot about what, you're, like, what the person is going to do. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. But in this setting, it's very interesting because rather it being just what one individual is doing, it gets you to think what you're going to do yourself and what you're going to make out of your own life and how to engage other people and teach Great. them. Great. That's very rewarding for me, and thank you. Mm -hmm. I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. Well, I don't know much about this whole process. Michigan State hasn't had one of these before. I hope we have many more, and I hope other people don't have to die to do it. No. Uh, <laughs> Nobody's going to die from this. But this is a, well, this is, I say, the capstone kind of lecture, but... You know, I, I like giving class. I plan to keep doing what I'm doing tonight for the next many years because I'm doing it all the time anyway, and the students have seen me do it before. This isn't much different than class. No. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. I'm amazed at the number of people here tonight. 
I expect we might get 10 or 20 people, but it's really neat. That's why I <laughs> protected myself by having the students here. <laughs> thank you. Thank you all so much for coming out, definitely. Uh, thank you to my representatives, to uh, ASMSU. Thank you to uh, Dr. Maybank. She's been continuous support. Uh, Roger Ludi, thank you for coming out. Mike Leahy. And of course, thank you, Dr. Pochin, for doing this for thank us. Thank you, Chris. That was nice. It worked out really well. You guys were great. Each one of you, you were really great. I appreciate you very much.